at least a handful of people will know who you are that didn't before. We'll take that handful. And of course, uh, we'll cross promote on Lost Cast. So. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. So both our money losing ventures can get more traffic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. My goal is broken. Hello. Welcome to episode five. I have a great show for you today. I have two interviews. We'll hear from indie game devs Matt Hackett and Jeff Blair. They'll talk about starting Lost Decade games, building a community, and developing HTML5-based games. We'll also hear from Stephen Gifford, an experienced game artist that works a lot with Unity 3D. Both interviews are interspersed through the episode. So enough intro. There's just way too much ground to cover if we're going to fit this in an hour. Let's begin. All right, so uh, I'm Jeff Blair, and... um... I am kind of the programmer engine guy, I guess, (laughs) if you want to call it, at LDG. And uh, we started LDG uh, mostly just because we love to make games. And kind of like anybody else that looks at games and wants to make their own versions of it, that's how how we got started. Um, And then HTML5 just kind of happened to be the right place at the right time. Right. So you were, you wanted to make a game. And you already knew JavaScript. So that's just kind of the language that you lean towards to make your games? Definitely. I mean, we, uh, so Matt, who is my co founder, hey. say hi, Matt. <laughs> uh, we met at a company called Raptor, and we were both doing front end JavaScript work. And at that point, I think we had both been uh, web devs for about eight or 10 years. And um, it was just that right time where, JavaScript in the browser was getting fast enough. You had Google coming out with Chrome and V8 and SpiderMonkey. And uh, there's a lot of competition among JavaScript engines for, you know, who can run the fastest. And, you know, it was about the same time when that whole idea of single page web apps that were very JavaScript intensive were coming about. Um, And I think Apple was the one that came out with the canvas tag. Um, And the canvas tag for me was really kind of the catalyst because it was, an API and a paradigm that I'm very familiar with when it comes to games, right? You just have this canvas, right? And you just paint pixels on it. You say, you know, I want to paint this rectangle of pixels to this position on the canvas, go. And so you didn't have to like try and make this weird DOM, you know, monstrosity into a game. Right. So that was 2011. Does that sound correct? Uh, I think it was yeah, 20, about 2010, maybe 2009, like when we first started tinkering, I think. When did yeah. you file the paperwork and Lost Decade Games became a reality? Oh, that was 2010. So yeah. 2010. And so you started tinkering and your first game was Onslaught Arena. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. It's just a little browser based. It was basically a game jam. It was um, a contest called Games Inspired by Music um, put on by Boing Boing. And uh, we entered it, and we just kind of came up with <laughs> this concept of a little gladiator dude in an arena fighting off hordes of goblins and stuff. And in the original game code, uh, I remember all of the variables, like the global variable, because that's what we did back then, uh, was called horde. <laughs> so it would be like horde.gameobject, horde.level, horde. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. So you two knew each other working at Raptor, is that correct? Yeah, uh, so, so I'll get the, I'll cover that one. So, by the way, I'm Matt Hackett. I'm the other half of LDG. Uh, Jeff and I have very similar histories and uh, skill sets, but I usually handle the more like visual stuff and the art side, that kind of a thing. Uh, so we had had some mutual friends when we were both working at Yahoo as front end engineers, and uh, you know we never really like chatted because if we had, <laughs> we we sur- surely it would have come up that we were both individually working on our own. JavaScript games because not that many people were doing that at that time. But we had mostly just kind of like, oh, hey, you know, this is some guy like, oh, this is my buddy Jeff. Hey, how's it going? This is Matt. You know, and then it wasn't until much later um, I had left Yahoo and gone to a company called Raptor, which is like a social network for gamers, kind of. And then um, I had pinged Jeff at one point because, like, um, <laughs> I had forgotten about this, but I actually interviewed him for my department at one point. And I remember being like, 
uh, a kind of a brutal interviewer, but Jeff was amazing, of course. He answered all the questions easily. And then we just started like, I, we had a little chat, but we didn't talk about games, you know? And then so I pinged him and I'm like, I know that you're not going to want to come work at Raptor because you're a really good engineer and you can go wherever you want, but, you know, we're hiring. So if you know anybody, let us know. And he was like, eh, I don't know. I'm kind of bored here. So let's talk. And I was like, <laughs> struck gold because, you know, really good engineer in Silicon Valley. Come on. And then the moment we started working together, like it came up really fast. You know, it was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm just working on this little JavaScript game. And, you know, the other person's like, really? <laughs> Me too. We must be the only two people on the planet doing that. And so uh, we started chatting like right away about like um, where like let's let's meet together outside of work and talk and see where there's some overlap to see if we could work together and, and try to make something. So how long did that transition take where you you ping Jeff and then you both walked out on your jobs and LDG? <laughs> <laughs> there was there's quite a period of time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what happened is that uh, we had been working at Raptor for about a year. I think, or I had been working at Raptor for about a year. I'm sorry. So, uh, and Matt had been working there for, I don't know how long. I think that was, I had one year, then you started and then there was another year. So I think it was about two years total for me. Gotcha. Yeah. So from the time that, that I joined Raptor, it was about a year um, until we had gotten approached by a company called Game Closure and they were making um, HTML5 games to some extent. <laughs> <laughs> and kind of just like any other startup, what their vision was at the time that we talked to them and what they ended up pivoting to were sort of different. I mean, they're still in the games industry. Um, <clears throat> I'd but say drastically different. Drastically. <laughs> I mean, they're still doing <laughs> games, but yeah, yeah, it's pretty pretty different. But when they approached us, they had kind of, they had seen Onslaught Arena, which we had made uh, previous to that. And they had approached us and said like, hey, why don't you come down to our offices and like, we'll just talk because we're interested in HTML5 games and you guys are doing HTML5 games. So... Uh, let's talk. And so we went down there, we talked to them and they were talking about building um, some like really interesting HTML5 based multiplayer experiences with games. So uh, they were talking about those kinds of games, which obviously, you know, we're huge fans of things like Magic the Gathering and they wanted to do multiplayer games. And, you know, we love retro arcade action, difficult games. Um, and so they basically made us an offer to come be employees zero and one or one and two or something. Something at their company and to work on HTML5 JavaScript games. And so we were like, uh, sure, mostly. I mean, I think we thought about <laughs> it, but it was a it was a pay decrease from what we were making at Raptor because they were a startup and they couldn't afford to pay. So, but we got some equity or something. Yeah. I think that was a easy decision for us because we had also just come away from like we were talking I don't want to say the company cuz I don't know what we're supposed to say and what we're not, but there was a company we were talking to that had a substantial contract that they were considering granting to us. And it was one of those one of these things where it was like, you know, you just make a game, you get this lump sum that was pretty significant, and then like we'll help you launch it with our platform and that kind of a thing. Yeah, you referred to that several times about the early days where HTML5 was at the hype and yeah. your early pioneers into that. Yeah, because it's a much different climate now. Like, it feels like a lot of people are making HTML5 games, but it w it wasn't a thing back in 2010. When you were making a game in JavaScript, people would be like, you know, why? Why are you doing that? You know. <laughs> right, but then, but then, essentially, Steve Jobs killed Flash, so H so right. HTML5 was the the only answer if you wanted to do that. Yeah, exactly. You already you are deep already in there. Right. So just as an example to give like uh, like where the industry was at that time, uh, we made this game called Onslaught Defense, which was this very basic shooter, almost like a Gradius or an R-Type, but like very simple, very arcadey, one screen, just monsters come down and you shoot them with swords and it played in your browser on your mobile phone, right? And I put it on Hacker News and I said something like, open this in your phone browser and it was linked to that game and that was on the front page of Hacker News. And if you tried that now you'd get buried because nobody cares. There's literally thousands of games that you can play in your in your browser on your phone. Nobody cares anymore. But even just, you know, four or five years ago, uh, that was a big deal. So you were doing, so you walked out, you're doing contracts. It was all good. And at that time, you started working on your games. And your biggest hit thus far is a wizard lizard. Yes, correct.
I would say our only <laughs> quote unquote hit. That's pretty fair as well. Yeah. Well, I liked Lava Blade. I'll call that one a hit. Awesome. Thank well, you. I'll take it. Yeah. I mean, we could put that on like the testimonial part of the website. There we go. I'd call it a hit. Dan Nagel. <laughs> Ship it. <laughs> so, did you begin a wizard lizard because you knew the HTML5 five hype would dry up? Or is that has always been your goal is to work on first party games? I think it's always been our goal to work on first party games. Um, <clears throat> the contract stuff was largely a means to an end for us, uh, over, maybe even since the beginning. So, just to kind of step just a one step backwards, we eventually left game closure um, about about eight months after starting there um, because the company pivoted in ways that we weren't really happy with. And the climate at that point, like Matt was saying, was so good. We had multiple people contacting us asking for mobile web games, right? Because that was like you said, Steve Jobs killed off Flash. <laughs> and so there was this huge demand. So there were people that had vast libraries of Flash games that they wanted ported to HTML5. There were new portals cropping up every week that wanted to ingest your HTML5 games into their platform and resell them and white label them and all this kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, we could tell for a couple of reasons. One, uh, that the quality bar wasn't very high just because even at that time, um, the mobile performance wasn't too good and people's phones weren't very fast either. Not like they are today. <laughs> and so... Um, you know, but we started doing these contract and largely mobile game development um, things because that's where we were getting all the traction from, right? Like we had people saying, hey, we want to pay you to make mobile HTML5 games. Um, and it was actually a pretty a pretty cool um, time for us because we were basically doing white labeling, um, which is where we would create a game and then we would license it non-exclusively to a bunch of different partners. And that felt like a nice win because, you know, we were developing one game and then being able to sell it multiple times. Um, but that doesn't scale super well, as it turns out, because there's probably, even if we were able to get our games sold to all of the people that we knew, it was probably like, you know, a couple dozen different companies that would buy the game for between 500 and a thousand dollars a piece. Um, but we had always kind of talked about bigger games and, and at that time, especially like Matt and I were very big console gamers. I think neither of us were really playing PC games very heavily at that point. Yeah, mostly Xbox 360 at that time. As mentioned before, A Wizard Lizard is Lost Decade Games' biggest slash only hit. It was written in HTML5 using a custom engine they call Jin. It is currently available on Steam and Humble Bundle. Lava Blade was a turn-based strategy game that preceded AWL and never made it to Steam. So you began work on AWL, and how long did the AWL Wizard Lizard development take? That's a hard question to answer because uh, it began as Crypt Run, and our premise was kind of just a very simplified version of The Legend of Zelda, only procedurally generated, uh, which was... Kind of inspired by Spelunky. <laughs> What's that? I've been trying myself to figure out when your timeline for development by just going by your Lost Cast episodes. And the first mention is July 2nd, 2013, which I imagine mm. you've been working on it before then because you're talking about your, your Kickstarter. Upwards, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, until we push you into the deep end. Uh, so, Crypt Run is also like our most ambitious uh, project because we're not just doing the game like we have in the past. We're also doing uh, a live demo in two weeks at an expo called California Extreme. We're doing uh, a Kickstarter, which we're yep. just announcing for the first time on this podcast. Um, we're looking to launch it at the same time as the California Extreme live demo, which is July thirteenth and fourteenth. Thirteenth and fourteenth. It's a yeah. Saturday and Sunday. Um, so like not this weekend, but next weekend. Yeah, depending on when you listen to this, but yeah. Right. Um, or it could be in the past. It probably will be in the past. I, would th I think most <laughs> listeners will find this much later. But uh, if you happen to be in the Bay Area, please come. Yes. I want to well, say gonna... April. 
that comes to mind. I remember looking at the log at one point. So I think there's a couple things that happened. Like um, originally we were actually going to do a contract for a company in oh, Silicon yeah. Valley and they, much like game closure, they had a HTML5 multiplayer game engine type thing they wanted to do. And they had contracted us to build a game, a multiplayer game against their API. Um, but we were like the first people doing it with their API and they were on shifty ground. And like, honestly, we were on shifty ground as game designers and developers as well. I mean, the tech was changing out so fast um, that it was difficult. And um, so they had they wanted this contract done and we were working on that game and, and our concept for that was Crypt Run. But it was a multiplayer game. But eventually they had decided that they their API and their platform weren't ready for third-party developers yet. And so they uh, we parted ways um, amicably, so that was fine. Um, but what we ended up with is we had this code and these assets for this kind of multiplayer dungeon crawling game that we didn't really know what to do with. And I think that, um, I think it was between that time that we made Lava Blade right after that. Mm, and yeah. then immediately after that, after we made Lava Blade, I think we turned around and said like, hey, let's do something with these Cryptron assets. And that's how the Cryptron game kind of came to be Cryptron. It, it, we basically just turned the multiplayer version into a single player dungeon crawler in the spirit of Legend of Zelda. Right. And you simplify that, but the, your timeline you're talking about is a year of development, essentially. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of that was we had that other game, uh, like for a period of time we were working on what was called Super Lava Sword, but ended up being Lava Blade, the game you had mentioned earlier. So that's when we turned a side-scrolling platformer game into a turn-based strategy game, which I don't recommend doing. <laughs> but then there was also, like we talk about licenses back then, and you know we were not paying the bills at all through first-party games because we didn't have any, you know? So when we say a year of development, like maybe only three months of that was working on the first party games like Crypto and stuff we wanted to. The rest, like filling in the blanks, it would be stuff like we made a half dozen more white label licensable games. And then not just that, but we also like, you know, I was spent a week or two weeks just emailing, you know, we would just be doing like uh, like networking and trying to get more licenses sold, you know. So the so the year of development includes a bunch of um, I don't want to call them, but distractions as you pay the bills. I would totally call it distractions. <laughs> okay. So Yeah, and that was a really hard time to to focus on anything because at any given moment we might have one contract, four licenses, and then we're also trying to push forward our own first party games. So we felt very divided and it was uh, yeah, it was hard to focus on stuff. Is this a typical scenario with small indie shops? They're trying to work on their own games, but they're constantly working on uh other people's gains to keep the lights on is that pretty standard it sounds oh, not I, uncommon to me <laughs> yeah i think if everyone i've talked to it kind of seems like most people either have a day job and they make indie games on the side until somehow they get enough money to go independent <clears throat> or they're independent and they're making up a lot of their income with contract work yeah right so but you two are unique in that it's now pushing six years and you're still open. Yes. <laughs> Although, I mean, we we got pretty lucky with the Wizard's Lizard, to be honest, that it made some amount of money that we were able to not do contracts for a while. Um, but it's hard. I think that, you know, to be perfectly honest, I think that we're sort of in a sophomore slump in some ways uh, in terms of, you know, I, I wish we would have followed up a Wizard's Lizard uh, more quickly with another title, another first party title. For sure. Um, because I don't think we're out of the woods in terms of having to augment our income with contracts. Yeah, not just yet. They've already announced their follow-up title to Wizard's Lizard. It will be a Wizard's Lizard 2 to build upon the success they've already laid. AWL was released on Steam June 16, 2014. One and a half years later, AWL 2 is still very deep in development. So what happened? I'm going to intentionally pause on this cliffhanger and introduce our next guest. He is a highly experienced game artist that works a lot with Unity 3D. If you can state your name. My name is Stephen Gifford. Okay, and what do you do? So I am a graphic designer, multimedia artist, and I work primarily on games and multimedia, training simulations, uh, serious games, things like that. So you, your primary focus is art for games? That is correct. Okay. 
do you have, uh, I know that for a while Unity was used for 3D and 2D as kind of an afterthought, but now they've had a really hard push into 2D. Do you have thoughts on their 2D effort? Is it bearing fruit? Um, you know, we don't do like um, platformer type games or anything like that. So it's not something that, uh, you know, I, it, but as far as like, if you want to talk about like uh, 2D, you know, animated games, then I would say it's got all the tools you need, but you might find um, that there's some other tools out there like Spryder. I don't know if you've ever seen Spryder. that. Spryder? But Spryder's a really awesome tool, and it's fairly cheap. Basically, you can create characters, and then you can rig them up within the Spryder engine, and then it spits out an XML file that allows Unity will go in there and parse that information, and it basically means that you can have rigged characters that are in 2D, so you can have like a, a guy running, jumping, you can have all these different poses and states that you can, you know, um, tie into your code when you want to, you know, switch different states or have them wearing different, you know, clothes or have a sword in one hand or whatever. Are there a lot of tools where there's a bit of shortcoming and the Unity tool set and if you look outside of Unity you might find a little helper tool to do these Absolutely. kinds of things. I mean that's the thing. Have a, There's tons of stuff like that on the asset do you have, store. Do you have ones that you would, would like to recommend? You just gotta look and I don't really do a lot of that stuff uh, as far as 2D animated sprite stuff so it's it's hard for me to recommend but as far as just tools in general um, yeah, there's a bunch of tools that I use. NGUI is one of them. Text Mesh Pro is another one. Particle effects stuff that you can buy, the shuriken particles for, and there's just a zillion of those available out there. Most of them are in the asset store. Yeah, I, hate, I feel like I'm pushing, you know, the Unity asset store like I'm, it's, you know, it's really cool. The thing with Unity is, uh, and, and now Unreal, now that it's become, uh, a free, you know. Well, it's free. Engine. It's free with a uh, percentage license. Well, yeah, and, and that can get expensive if you, if your game really does well. Yeah. So, um, but if you just want to develop something, you know, that's the thing. If if your game really does well, that's not really a problem, right? If you, I guess, so. <laughs> if you have, if you have it's to like, pay oh, a percentage, <laughs> it's like, oh no, my game made a million dollars. I gotta pay it's like. 10,000, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> and so, like, it's something that I want to investigate because I haven't really gotten into, into Unreal? The Unreal much, but uh, I want to yeah. see if the tool set that they have for, you know, artists and integrating what we like to do is anywhere close to what, you know, Unity has, because... Um, I think Unreal is more of a code package and not yeah. much... And not much GUI. Uh, you work within the Unity GUI, which you know to do things, and it's really, really nice. I don't remember. But I think Unreal now that it a, does have all that stuff. It does. Yeah. Is it still? They even have their own so-called asset store. Apparently. Is it as extreme resource intensive as it used as to Unity? be? Unity. No, Unity is not as bad. I'm talking uh, the resources required to run it. Like I had uh. a fairly recent MacBook Pro and they couldn't handle it. Um, so well, you may have that stuff. But if you're running a lot of Adobe tools, you probably have a pretty stout machine. Yeah, I mean, we, we all use very heavy duty, you know, workstations at, at, at my office, but I mean... You'll probably be fine though. We, we all, you know, develop, uh, you know, one development cycle for all devices so it's like everything we do um, that's a little tricky and we could get into that but that would be a whole another conversation <laughs> it actually, actually sounds pretty interesting because um, you know there's so many different aspect ratios and resolutions it's really hard to to, to do that and maintain you know uh, integrity with the visuals but it can be done and that's what we do you know 
So do you have a collection of all the targets? You got a, you have a Mac, you have a Windows PC, you have an Android, you have an iPad. Uh, so you know, within our work environment, yes, we do have all of that stuff, and because we develop for the military, we develop. Uh, we're under certification um, requirements, so because of that we have to do a lot of testing and we test on all devices um, fortunately that usually falls on the developer to actually <laughs> do that so let's get back to lost ticket games and the extra long adabil 2 development effort instead of immediately coming <laughs> out with the a wizard lizard 2 you did a transition into unity and then you eventually gave up Unity to go back to your HTML5 engine. And I find that fairly interesting. And I wonder if you had any comments about that. Um, it is pretty interesting. And I think... You call that a, I don't know, three or four month uh, distraction? That deep dive into Unity? In some ways I would. Um, it's kind of hard because on one hand, I don't think that you should never pop your head out of the sand and experiment with new tech. Um, it may have been not the right time for us to do it. And to be clear, like there's actually a lot of things that I really like about Unity. Um, but I think that what it boils down to for us specifically is that we are trying harder to just make games. And Unity, while powerful, um, was something that we didn't have as good a grasp on and we weren't able to move as quickly with as HTML5. And yeah. so for our particular use cases, um, HTML5, like it's comfortable, it does what we need it to do. We have our own custom engine that we know inside and out. And so every time there's any question about so how some feature works or whether how some feature needs to change in order for it to do what we want, um, we can just do it and it, it's very fast for us to do that because we know exactly how the engine works and how we want it to work. Uh, whereas Unity, you know, is more of a black box. And I guess the trade-off is, is that with Unity, you know, hopefully it does everything you need it to do. Um, but in reality, that's never the case. Well, you can, yeah. you can look at it as some solace in that you've had at least one success with HTML5, so you know it can be done. Exactly. Yeah. And that was the thing that kind of held us back. Cause like, you know, there's lots of problems we had with HTML5 and, and still have There's performance issues. There's the fact that it's really hard or sometimes impossible to get it on certain platforms. Like, you know, a Sony console is just a, like can't do it sometimes. And we really wanted to find something that was more cross platform. That was something that did more for us. You know, we didn't have to fight for every single feature we wanted to add, you know, like unity just does a lot of things for you. But the bottom line was we had like, you know, each a decade of experience working with JavaScript and web technologies. And we also had, um, we just had a lot going for us in that regard, right? And so when we went over to Unity, we didn't have the experience of, of like, you know, the end to end. We come up with a concept and we ship the game all the way to the finish line. You know, but we did have that with uh, HTML5 and JavaScript. So it was like a, a safe place to retreat. Um, and I should point out too that like we had that Kickstarter um, for Wizard Lizard 2 initially, which I mean, there's a truckload of problems with that but basically what that kickstarter would have enabled us to do is it would have given us enough of a runway where we would have been able to go ahead and learn unity and you know catch up our skills with unity to where html5 skills were but with that not having been successfully funded we had to kind of you know fall back to what we knew what was tried and true and what we were good at frankly right i've done several projects with html5 it's not really any different than any other. The the only difference is, you know, if I were up to speed on all of Adobe's products, they probably have some tools now that actually make it easy to develop, uh, to to create your GUI and do animations and stuff. But I haven't actually gotten into those. When we did uh, HTML5, we we did four or five major projects. In HTML5, we just did, we, we designed and laid out the, the graphics the way we wanted to, and then we just cut them up and handed them over to the developers because we didn't actually have like an editor or anything at that time or, or any way of like, you know. There isn't a, to my knowledge, a nice 
unified editor like Unity offers. There's uh, basically you're loading up disjoint programs to put all the pieces together. And one thing that Adobe has now is their, their Flash t tool, which is being renamed to Animate, mm -hmm. has a, kind of an HTML5 export mechanism. Cool. And you can pick that up and drop it into their own HTML5 engine called yeah. CreateJS. So do you feel like that HTML5 is is a, um, since Flash is sort of dying, do you feel like that's a, actually, you know, equivalent of what Flash can do? It, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you only care about mobile, like, and there's a lot of games, you only care about Android and iOS, that's all you care about, HTML5 there's is not that great. There's way better tools. You'd be better off doing a Corona. You'd be better off doing Unity. Now, if you want to target mobile and desktop at the same time, then Unity is better still because it can hit them all. But if you want it to be in a web browser, if you want someone to go to your game in a web browser, boom, there it is. HTML5 is pretty much the only way to go. Yeah. And, and you know, you, my you, feeling is, you know, because you don't have to have a plug-in. Right, you don't want the, as soon as you ask the end user to install something, that is a huge barrier to getting your game played. Sure. But if they can just load in their browser, then you'll have interaction with them. And that is where HTML5 wins. HTML5 is going to replace Flash. It already has because mobile never had it. Yeah. But if you want to develop a serious game and you're only targeting uh, one or two platforms and you're okay with them installing something, yeah. then there's way better tools in HTML5. Yeah, I mean, my feeling about HTML5 is is what I've seen some amazing stuff with it, but I think what happened when Adobe killed Flash, essentially, and I don't know if it's really Adobe, but or the industry killed Flash, you can, the, you can argue that Steve Jobs killed Flash. <laughs> the, the thing is, like, it really made it m much more difficult to create the kinds of really cool interactive stuff that, that people were doing. Because really, if you look at, like, the history of uh, and the explosion of all the, the social games and the web games and all of, all of those advert games that were being built, like, most of that cool you know animated stuff was being done by artists but without you know some sort of tool to build and i know i know animate is a stripped down you know version of flash and and it can do you know simple tween animation and stuff like that but you know and that's cool if it has some way to you know create html5 but for the most part um, that's been something that i've been watching and wonder you know how that's going to evolve in the future because um, when you hand over, you know, your stuff to a coder and go, yeah, I would like this to, you know, do all this different stuff and, you know, just the way something moves and tweens and, you know, the uh, motion of it is something that really takes an artistic eye to create and to do. And a lot of times, you know, when I've had no control over that and it's just been up to the developer, it's, it's really painful to get it looking the way you want it to. Do you feel like you... So, Flash is now dead, we can argue, you know, it's, or it's dying if it's not already dead. So that Flash tool suite is pretty much gone from your toolkit. Yeah. And do you feel like you're now missing something because you lost that toolkit? So if you wanted to, if right now I want an animation on the web and I said, go do it, you would have to do it in HTML5 and the tools just aren't mature exactly. for that. And exactly. Yeah. So you're now struggling in that area. Um, yeah, I mean, that's totally the case. And so... You know, if I do get hit up to do a project like that, I'll be honest, you know, I'm not even really sure. I'd have to do a lot of investigation to get, uh, to be able to do what I would want to do, you know, especially if it was something complex, you know. So, you know, I think that's where, you know, where you have 
artists and developers that work really well together and they both have passion for the product, it always ends up being something that's good, you know, but it's really got to be a situation where, you know, everybody involved, it's, you know, is, is passionate about it. You're in some kind of luck, though, because Unity has an HTML5 export, but the performance is horrible. I ran some tests, and uh, I guess I could link my tests to my notes, where I made a very simple game. It was like a, like a bowl, like a pool table ball, just kind of rolling. And I exported to Android, to iOS, to uh, Unity installer, to HTML5. And, you know, it ran on all of them. The HTML5 one consumed 100 megs. So a pool wow. ball rolling across the table, 100 megs. That's crazy. Yeah. So it, it's, they're getting there, but it's not ready for prime time, obviously. But there may be hope where, you know, you can, uh, you can hit a web browser without having to do a plug-in. Right, and and it, do you think that's because of the way that the code of HTML is really? Um, it's because it's, it's interpreted. Yeah, it's it's actually. It not, is. You know, it's not a binary. You know, that, that is it's, that is exactly all, the problem. Yeah. Because uh, all the Unity games and all the Android, they're performant because it is compiled to machine code. So when you're compiling to JavaScript, you have this layer on top of this layer on top of this layer and now you finally get to the game code and it has to go up four layers before it yeah. can finally execute and and uh, so you have that hitting you then you have the second problem hitting you where JavaScript is inherently single threaded yeah. so you can't have multiple threads performing work it all has to be done on the single thread yeah. jumping off and that is a performance hit. so you have like three or four performance hits so it is, it is never going to be the same performance as a compiled app. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see that. Um, and, you know, it's always been one of my biggest, you know, issues, I guess, with, with you know, because when, when HTML5 first came out, you know, all the developers that, that I knew were like, oh, yeah, this is great. But then, you know, like... You know, if it takes you four times longer to build something that looks, you know, just as good as it would in Flash or something, you know, well, it's it a is, problem. It's a requirement if you want to hit the web browser. Yeah. So if you want it to run in the web browser, there's no other option. So it is, it's not going to go away. But I think the superior tools, the Unity, Corona, Unreal, and all those others, if they only care about one platform, such as either... The Android, iOS, you know, installer-based gaming, those tools will always win. Yeah. Steven's experience is a reminder that for every major shift in technology, there will be winners and losers. While Lost Ticket Games was an early pioneer and managed to ride some of the HTML5 hype, Stephen Gifford was finding out that a large portion of the energy he invested in learning Flash just evaporated. Fortunately, he found new success with Unity. Remember, when your business is tech, you cannot slow down. Lost Ticket Games also recognized Unity as a potentially superior tool over HTML5 for desktop game dev. They discussed it on their own podcast, mentioning many of the reasons I discussed earlier, and ultimately backpedaled when their Kickstarter failed. I'll play a bit of that audio now. What do you do when you're a small indie company and you're hoping to go to Kickstarter to kind of pave your road because your runway is rapidly depleting, you know, and you know that, like, there's definitely not enough money in the coffers right now <laughs> to allow us to just sit there, heads down, and work on the game, right? Like, we just can't do that. Like, that's no longer in the cards, so we have to... uh you gotta go to the drawing board, you know, like when you when your plans fail and blow up in your face. I was gonna say, yeah, go bust tables. Go bust tables. <laughs> that kind of goes, uh, you know, back to what we're gonna do next. And what is that? You know, we had had some kind of different ideas for the way that the game was gonna play. Um, it was gonna be kind of more like 
Legend of Zelda E. Yep. And less like twin stick shootery. The not the exact game, but the spirit of the game with a lot of the rough edges polished up and more content, new content, uh, new abilities, but stuff kind of living in the same the same vein. Right. Uh, and so to that end, you know, uh, it's actually easier to kind of take our existing code base and prototype off that and try to come up with a new version that way. Yeah. So um, get ready for some LDG backpedaling. <laughs> LDG backpedaling. <laughs> Is that like a thing now? Oh, I, I'm sure. Don't hasn't changed my opinion about anything about HTML5. <laughs> Literally the only reason that it's considerable is because there's a lot less work to take that product to market so and much, you can focus yeah. on like the extensions and the upgrades and the refactorings instead of like building out everything new right yeah it's like basically just months and months ahead of where the unity project would be although it once they both reach the finish line the unity project would have a lot of advantages right it would like yeah faster more stable more platforms yada 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 uh, but the fact of the matter is that, like, you know, our runway just was not enough to enable us to kind of reshift uh, and have a new platform, you know? Like, it, uh, we just, we need more time, basically. Indeed. When your timeline is cut short, the very best tool is the one you already know. You've already heard a few clips from it, but it's time for Lost Cast. Now it's in fourth year to get a proper introduction. Legends once told of a podcast lost now in the sea of time. These ancient recordings spoke of games and the arcane art of HTML5. Today, Jeff Blair and Matt Hackett bring these words back to life. It is lost cast, and may your ears receive it. I get so lost cast is is kind of interesting because um, we talked before about how we were working at this um, this mobile startup, and they kind of pivoted in a way that didn't really interest us. And um, around the the middle or the end of that relationship, um, I think that we were pr- probably looking for a reason to not be in the office that much or something. But we were like, let's just start a podcast. You know, we we had just been started to work in the game industry full time for like six months or so. Uh, we were pretty green. We were really excited. We were eager to learn. We were surrounded by because this startup was hiring like crazy. So we were surrounded by people who really knew what they were talking about. They were very interesting. And so we were like, let's just start podcasting and started interviewing our friends. Um, I had kind of already known how to do that stuff because I took some audio classes in college and I even already had some gear. Uh, Like I didn't have everything I needed, especially just to make the best quality show we could, but I I at least had a leg up and that I knew uh, how to do it. And so um, we started just recording once in a while when we felt like it. And then after, uh, after some time, it was like, the one thing that people kind of latched onto, you know, like we had Twitter, we had a blog, we had a Facebook, we, we tried everything just to kind of, you know, find a community and build an audience. And uh, Lost Cast was the one that far and away had the most, uh, the most engaging response, you know, so we decided to double down on it. And we were like, you know what, we like doing it. We like talking. We, we love video games and development. So let's just, let's do it weekly. And uh, we've been doing it weekly now for like three years, I guess. That sounds about right. Three years. I remember when I started listening, and I actually tried to track down when I started listening, and I think it was Lost Cast 20 when you're talking about the Ouya. Oh, nice. That's early. So yeah. that was 2012, and I remember an episode would come by, then maybe three weeks later. Yeah, we we were looking at it like, oh, my favorite TV show comes out every so often. You know, it's hard to latch onto that. You want to be like every Tuesday, every Tuesday night. You know, I watch my favorite show, or like, you know, every Saturday I love SNL or whatever it is. You need something to know with what frequency or like when to look for it. So we just decided to double down on on weekly and haven't looked back since. Right. Welcome to Lost Cast, episode twenty nine. I'm Matt Hackett. I'm Jeff Blair. It's been a while, huh? Uh, just a little bit. Two months, I think. 
Really? This is probably a trend if you listen to the show. as probably a recent episode where we were like, wow, it's been two months. <laughs> derp, derp, derp. Remember back when we were like, let's do it every week. We're like those guys that like make a blog post saying, sorry, we haven't posted in a while. Oh, uh, really? Because I have to say I hate that. Yes. If, I, if I go to someone's blog and I see a post like that, I'm gone. And I actually find that pretty interesting. Your lost cast and the audience that you build with it your lost cast audience because your podcast is very heavily developer oriented and yes. i don't really consider that the same kind of audience that would buy your games yeah <laughs> so you're talking to one audience and then you're building a product for a completely different audience exactly yeah my my wife's been telling me for years that we should be trying to like give our audience what they want you know because we've worked really hard to gather an audience of developers and then we're trying to sell them a game and a lot of them they'll even say this on our forum they're like i don't like your games <laughs> they're not for me you know like i don't like action games i like you know story heavy games and we don't really make story heavy games and uh, sometimes there's a mismatch there in taste and it's not a perfect fit. You know, like we should be trying to find more gamers. We should be making a podcast uh, for gamers. And we, we don't because I think it's like we we just like talking about the stuff behind the scene. And you don't get to see that a lot. You know, you see a, a brand new video game coming out. You see a, a poster. You see a, a commercial for it or something. And you don't get any sense of what it's like to make a game. You don't get that peek behind the scenes. And uh, it's something that Jeff and I can both just talk about all day and so it seemed like a natural fit it was like let's just talk about how the sausage is made you know right and i appreciate that i get a lot of insight into your work and you, you do it week after week after week and it's, <laughs> it's interesting content and i'm sure all your developers appreciate it but then oh, cool. you, you make a game and then maybe the handful of people have already bought the game so i'm wondering <laughs> Uh, where's the motivation that comes in to keep this going? Because I doubt you're making anything from it. From the podcast? Right. Yeah, we look at it as a loss leader. So it's like, you know, we give away some of our time to record it, to edit it. We put some of our hard money down to, to host it and to buy equipment and maintain that equipment. And what we get, though, is, you know, there are some benefits. It's very intangible. But we get, like, this very small community who's who's pretty tight. We get a lot of people who will say, like, you know, I, I've spent basically hundreds of hours doing what feels like hanging out with you guys and just talking about my favorite thing in the world, which is making video games. And we know that a lot of people feel that way. Like, they feel the same way we do. You know, they just love video games. They love making video games. They love seeing, you know, how the sausage is made. And so, like... We have seen that our community is there, but they're not in huge numbers, you know? And I think it is the kind of thing that we've mostly kept on life support over the years, uh, largely because we do know that there is some small number of people who care and also that, you know, we kind of enjoy doing it. So uh, we have kind of paid for it out of pocket. Um, but I mean, on that note, we have started to examine ways to make it like an actual uh, business thing, you know, like to have it pay for itself and to justify its its own existence. Um, so we've looked at Patreon and we have only kind of dipped our toes uh, into those waters to see if it's something our community would even <laughs> be on board for or if they would just shun it. So we've started to investigate to see if that's a possibility. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think that it's really interesting because one of the things that keeps us doing Lost Cast, I think, is really just the community. I mean, if people weren't responding to it the way that they do, then there would be no benefit for us. I mean, the benefit for us is that we get to engage with people who are like-minded and who like the content and who, you know, basically feel like we're buddies. And uh, I think that's a really cool feeling. And every time we've talked about dropping the podcast from the things that we do every week, you know, it's almost been a non-starter just because, you know, we feel entrenched and we really love doing it. And at the end of the day, one of the reasons we want to go independent is because we want to do what we want. Right. I would probably have not held on and bought your games if it wasn't for the podcast that kept my interest. Nice. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's, that's a great example. Right. Although, I mean, the revenue from all that effort to get money <laughs> from me, I don't know, what was that, like $20? So... Right. Yeah. Like these mobile companies, they put a dollar into ads and they get a user and they're like, yeah, it's a good relationship here. We spend like <laughs> hundreds of dollars over several years and hundreds of hours of content. We're like, whew, finally, we got that sale. <laughs> That's a losing proposition, but some, it, sometimes it feels worth it. 
Vozcast will definitely be in the show notes. If you enjoy podcasts like My Code is Broken, but would prefer content that is more game dev oriented and has a more frequent release schedule, and also slightly biased towards HTML5, you really should go check it out. There's lots of insight. Let's now hear from Steven about resources for artwork. What tools do you use for your various graphical tasks? Is it the 3D, the 2D, and what are some of your favorite tools? Um, so, like, obviously we use all the Adobe stuff. Is that um, pretty much a requirement? If you want to be serious about graphics, you need an pretty much. I mean, Adobe subscription? If you're gonna if you're going to be in the gaming world, if you're going to... You, you need to have a really good grasp of all the Adobe tools. Now, not everybody knows, you know, After Effects and, and some of the more specialized tools, but for the most part, you, you really need to know Illustrator and Photoshop um, for, you know, art creation. Um, you know, a lot of... of is, is the bulk of your art vectors so you can scale it, or do you... Do uh, you... No, it's not generally um, vector... Um, most of it, you know, and everybody has a different way of a uh, style for creating their art. A lot of times people do want to use Illustrator and create vector art, but for example, in Unity, we don't really use vector art. There's a plugin called Scaleform, which you can use, which allows you to bring in vector art into, uh, essentially it, it allows you to bring in flash files into Unity, and you could build your GUI that way, but... We used to use it. We don't use that now. We use another product called NGUI, which is um, just a, a third-party plugin for Unity for um, all the GUI design. What about your 3D modeling? What do you use for that? For 3D modeling, well, I use Cinema 4D, but I would say that's mostly used in the motion graphics industry. Um, it is a high-end program. Uh, but it's more used in, in motion graphics, and most of the studios use uh, for that, that do 3D games they use like Maya or 3D Studio Max uh, or Soft Image. Okay. And if you don't have if you can't afford the um, software you can always use um, like Blender. Right. So, um, if you're developing in Unity and the reason I, I bring up Unity obviously is because it's, it's sort of like a uh, editor that has a lot of ready-made prefabs and assets that you can just go to their asset store if you want grass <laughs> you just is that where you get most of your assets at the um, store if it's something that i don't have and would take a extensively long time to build it's um a lot of people are like oh i would never create use something that somebody else has done but but i have no problem with it you know if it's it, most of the art that I do, the 2D art and that stuff, I do, you know, design it myself. But when it comes to that kind of assets, if it's a building or something that I need, sure, I'd go to the asset store. If it's a plug-in that I need to do some kind of particle effect or something, I would definitely go to the asset store. What about um, other sites such as OpenGameArt.org? Do you ever, do you, would you recommend that? Because I... I put stuff on Open Game Art, but I'm always worried that the stuff on there may have originated from somewhere else that I'm exactly. not. Exactly. I mean, if you're going to do, gonna do, do that something, kind of I don't really use that site, but I mean, if you're going to be selling your game or if you're concerned about copyright issues, for sure, I would, I would, you know, be wary of going out there and grabbing stuff off of open source sites like that. And what about, um, do you feel the same about music? Do you work much with music? Um, so when it comes to music, when we actually have a um, on-staff music designer, then that's nice, but that's not always the case. And from my own personal, um, you know, from experience, like if I need something, I would definitely go to a site like Envato. And um, in Bato, yeah, um, about Audio Jungle. You heard of that one? Yeah, Audio Jungle. I think that parent company is in Bato, but anyway, it's Audio Jungle. It's the um, they have a bunch of different sites Graphic River, um, Theme Forest, like it's all like canned, you know, music. Do they, and do art. they sell um, 
game game art too. Absolutely, they even sell. Okay, uh, I think that would be most useful for yeah. the people that would listen to this podcast. Like, th that's the best place to go find stuff for cheap because you can buy like even code snippets and really cool little you know utilities and things that people have already built to to plug into your game. Now, if you're developing an Unreal Engine or anything like that, I can't say if they have any specific stuff for that. But like for Unity, I do know that they do have quite a bit of stuff for Unity. Okay. So what would you recommend for the, the one-man shop? As far as what, what do you mean? I want to build a game for iOS and Android. And it's basically a, a two-man shop trying to get a game out. Yeah, I mean, you need an artist, you need a programmer. That's really all you need to get something out the door. And, um, you know, obviously if you've ever done anything for iOS, it's a little bit more um, tricky because you have to deal with Apple on anything that you do, right? So, right. But that's not really a big issue. I think it's just more helpful if you've had, if you've been through that process before. Um, I you know, as an artist, never really had to, to actually uh, go through any of that process or what the requirements are, but... It's, it's not that terrible. It just sometimes takes Apple forever yeah. to approve it. But if you're not doing anything weird, this shouldn't be an issue. Yeah. Um, so, it, you know, that's the cool thing about um, doing games now is all it really takes is two people unless you're a really good artist and a coder you can do it yourself you know if you want to do it could you could you envision somebody envision somebody wanting to work on their game and they just go to the asset store to buy this piece that's missing from their skill set they'll go to Envato and buy this piece of art that you know they can't develop themselves and basically just piece all these little things together from over the internet. Is that a viable um, plan of attack? Absolutely. I know people that do that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, and they do pretty well. Jumping back to Lost Decade Games. Ragachan is an open source desktop HTML5 hacking tool that are wrote and released. It targets a Wizard's Lizard, Lava Blade, and a couple other games. It's been mentioned a few times on Lost Cast. Just like an announcement real quick. Um, Rogatron by Dan Nagel, a Lost Cast listener, is now open source. And I'm, I'm sure we've talked about it before on the podcast. But if you don't remember, it's kind of like, um, you know, I was going to say it's like Game Genie for Lost Decade Games. But I don't even know if uh, most of our listening audience would even remember Game Genie. Contradiction con. Raga Diction. <laughs> yes. No, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> Contratron. Dan should something. never let us name his software. <laughs> you can barely name podcasts, let alone I can. software. I think that's cool. And so that's one of the things that kind of came out of the podcast, right? Like you wouldn't have created Ragatron if the podcast didn't exist. No, I wouldn't have. And so it's cool that you created this open source and like hacking tool for one of our games. And like one of the things that we love to see is like people creating based on our creations, you know? So like Ragatron is a really cool example. Um, there's a guy in our forum who does comics um, people have done lots of fan art, and uh, that kind of stuff really gets us going. Right. So I was about forty percent worried that you would ask me to stop Ragatron. I, I have really? no idea why, but that was a concern for me. So I think, yeah, that's the kind of thing it's learned because, like, Nintendo would shut you down, right? Like Microsoft would shut you down. Like a big company, they almost would because they feel like they have to just to you know pay their lawyers' salaries or something. But that's one of the things you can get out of a small indie company is like. Like, we're lenient. We don't care. Like, we, we kind of love it all, you know? You know, we have such a small audience to begin with. Um, you know, have you seen, like, have you gotten any feedback from people that have used Rogatron and, and contacted you about it? Um, not that many. Maybe a handful. I, if, if Rogatron disappeared tomorrow, I probably wouldn't notice it in my server logs. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> 
Here's a question. Uh, do you think that Rogatron will support uh, the next Wizard Lizard game? If you write in HTML5, definitely. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Yeah, I, it's actually come up in conversation before because I, I was talking about, you know, it's, it's really cool when someone sees something that you made and, you know, wants to like supplement it. Like it, you know, inspires them to do some work of their own. And uh, the way that I pitched it to them is I was like, yeah, it was really cool. Like this developer made this thing. It's kind of like Game Genie for HTML5 games. <laughs> I kind of like that for some reason. I don't know if people are familiar with Game Genie these days. I guess another one would be, was it Game Shark? But basically, like, you know, back in the day when uh, the games were sold as hardware, like a cartridge or a disc or something, like with the cartridges especially, though, you could, like, you stick it into a Game Genie, which is its own hardware, and then that is what you put into the console. So it was like uh, kind of an intermediary between the game and the device, and it would, you know, alter the bytes and make the game different. You know what? Uh, oh, I want to say something about Rogatron real quick. I like the, how much effort you put into making it easy to use. Nice. I think that's something that not a lot of people do. <laughs> and especially with these kinds of tools that hack stuff. I mean, you know, a lot of them are just really arcane in terms of user interface. Yeah, that is <laughs> something that I take a lot of care in for my software to be easy to use. But nice. I, I care a lot about that. The easier I can make it, the less support I have to give it. Mm. Right. I like and that. I think that that's, that's something that we've been trying to internalize on games too right is that if the user has almost any friction especially with games right like when you're in a different position where i remember when i was working um way 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 before ldg i was working at a medical billing company and our product was so convoluted i thought um <laughs> and some of it by nature just because you know medical stuff there's a lot of ins and outs but you know we didn't really have to care about user interface because what would happen is is that the doctor's would make the decision about what software they wanted to buy, mostly on price and, and maybe on features. Um, but nowhere along the line did the people actually using the software really get a say usually. And so it was kind of like, hey, we just bought this software suite for our office and here you go. <laughs> and so half of our <laughs> company was just dedicated to support. How do I use this? How do I do that? What happens when this happens? And uh, But with a game, you know, or other software where people can just walk away from it. You don't really have that luxury, you know, and especially when you're talking about games, if you frustrate people right off the bat and you put up walls and barriers, uh, they're going to be gone. They're gone, yeah. <laughs> and that's the show. A big thank you to the guests. Find me at Nagel Code. Find Lost Ticket Games at Lost Ticket Games. We'll both be tweeting when a Wizard's Lizard 2 arrives. All the sites and Twitter accounts will be linked in the show notes. For more developer-oriented podcast content, you should check out LostCast at lostdickandgames.com slash lostcast. Until next time, this is My Code is Broken, and I'm Dan Nagel, signing off. You got really robot-y for me, Dan. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the audio quality took a hit. <laughs> Sounds like Robo-Dan. Kind of sounds like a, an Atari arcade game. This microphone did that to me before. I'm going to try a real quick trick. Hold on one second. You sound pretty clear now. Yeah, you're sounding a lot better. Well, then maybe I won't mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just back away. Back so away, yeah. <laughs>